right side of the boot from Bustos. Down for Daniels. Roy off ball to goal. They're going to try to put it on. It's in the back of the net. A mistake from the cavalry keeper. And that might be Marco Bustos' first of the year. What a goal indeed. Hello and welcome to another edition of the CPL Newsroom Show. Christian Jack, as always, alongside Charlie oconnor Clark. On this week's show, we'll recap a week of all four games this weekend, bookended by 3-0 wins on Friday and, of course, a 3-0 win late on Sunday. Results this past week, Pacific FC 3, Cavalry 0, Marco Bustos and Jose Escalante own goal and Alejandro Diaz penalty put the Tridents on top of the league for around about 40 hours or so. <laughs> Halifax won, FC Edmonton won, a tale of two penalties as Tobias Wojcicki and Sam Salter both score from the spot. Forge FC 3, Valor FC 1, Moses Dyer had to put the visitors ahead, but it would have been if you're just watching live. Great strike equalized in the first half, and then a Terran Campbell brace won it for the Hamilton-based team. And then on Sunday, York United nil, Atletico Ottawa 3. Penalties from Balu Tabla and Oli Bassett with a Brian Wright goal in between, enough for a dominant performance to send Atleti top of the table. What went right? What went wrong? We'll break it all down for you over the next hour with some special guests as well. Uh, Charlie, great to see you. We were both there at York Lions Stadium yesterday. We start, I think, there yeah. where you and I were both in attendance. And coming in, the storylines were really around some key questions. Could York carry on the momentum from, the, from midweek against Cavalry? After two draws versus York this season and a cup defeat, are York a bogey team for Atleti? I think we got those answers and a lot more with an emphatic <laughs> away win. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the answer to could York continue that momentum was quite decisively no, no. unfortunately for them. Um, this was, I, I think, a really big game for Ottawa as well. We spoke about it a little before the game, how much they kind of needed a result here to keep pace with a couple of the other teams that had won this weekend. Uh, and this was an important one for them. They looked as organized as ever. They were they were so strong at, at you know holding York's attack to the very very kind of tamer areas of the pitch. They score in transition. This this second goal here, this Brian Wright goal, is really a perfect example of that of how quickly they can they can get forward when a team makes a really really silly mistake, as uh, Cedric Toussaint did here. Um, but I think this is a massive weekend for Atletico Ottawa, who obviously. Move into first place with this game. Uh, it was uh, a pretty fun one with the the amount of traveling fans they had there down at York Lions Stadium. Um, but again, it's it's kind of a moment where they had to prove that they do belong with some of the other teams at the top of the table, and I think that's kind of exactly what they did here. Yeah, it certainly was. First of all, you mentioned the atmosphere, busload of, of fans coming. Fantastic to see um, the Capital City Supporters Group out there, and, and boy, oh boy, they made a lot of noise. Uh, tremendous amount of noise yeah. uh in that one yeah um and, and you know what i thought a very educated fan base too it wasn't just like oh let's sing the iceland chant and bang the drum do you know what i mean like was there, mm -hmm. I, I thought they were really <laughs> really good um and, and their team backed it up no i mean we, we we'll get to some yeah. sound from drew becky and some others who talk about it in a second you mentioned it they i think we we're still kind of questioning are they for real even though you know it was a club away win they're now the first team to beat every team so far in the CPO, not even the end of July yet. But I feel, yeah. I still think when we looked at that top four, just because of reference points, Pacific won it. Forge have been there for a long time, two-time champs. Cavalry are always there. It was This was the team, no, that still kind of show us, show us what you can do. And after a midweek draw against yeah. Valor, it could have gone the other way. But Charlie, this was emphatic. This was a signal for from Atletico Ottawa to say, uh, no, we are more than capable of contending for this championship this year, and we are a playoff club. That's exactly what it is. You know, they've had a lot of, I think, close results go their way this season, which obviously is, in most cases, a, a mark of a good team and a team that's able to win and belongs in the playoffs. But uh, one of the things that we'd kind of spoken about going in and one of the maybe concerns that I had about Ottawa was that they maybe didn't put the ball in the net as consistently 
as some other clubs, but they put three in this time. Obviously, two of them are penalties, but you still have to get to those positions and make York make those mistakes in, in those transitional moments and draw the fouls. So for them to put three goals in the net while not really sacrificing any of that incredible defensive structure that's kind of their their bread and butter. Yeah. I think that's what most impresses me with Ottawa here is they're they're looking more and more dangerous uh, in attack. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, what Drew Becky called it the best half, I think, that they played this season, the first half. Uh, you know, we'll hear from Drew in a second, but that goes to show you what they had, everything about them. The way that they're tactically versatile, I think, is really, really intelligent. You know, they go from a three to a four when they're not in possession. Harworth mm-hmm. played very narrow. Acosta can come in. It was very much the case on the second goal. I tweeted it out. The second goal, by the way, is offside. Uh, it's narrowly offside um, if we've seen this from other angles. But I think regardless yeah. of that, we'll get to York in a second, Chile. But I think it just sums up everything they've got. They've got everybody working for the cause. No, all 11 players defensively are contributing. Um, even Balu Tabla, you know, Malcolm Shaw, Brian Wright, they're asked to score goals. But without the ball, they're doing a shift. They're interchanging. Sometimes they cover on the wing. Sometimes they stay up. They, they, they go back and forth in that 5-4-1 without the ball uh, occasionally as well. So, um Carlos Gonzalez deserves a lot of credit here, Charlie. You can see what he's molding here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Every player on the pitch in the 11, and even when you come off the bench, they know what's expected of them, especially off the ball. They know what spaces they want to occupy and where they want to to kind of prevent York or, or whatever opponent from playing through, which is important. Uh, you know, we saw some maybe different kind of diff- different kind of things from Ottawa in this game. We saw maybe Ali Bassett actually getting a little bit wider than yeah, usual well. uh he he kind of interchanged a lot with with carl hayworth who wanted to to maybe tuck in a little bit more uh which was a very interesting thing from them but again i think we see this tactile identity coming and one thing that maybe struck me yesterday was uh some of the younger players are getting a little bit more comfortable in that system you know we saw maybe they weren't as comfortable putting zach Bahus out there earlier in the season mm-hmm. which is part of the reason that the they've maybe struggled for under 21 minutes but now we see that players like him, younger players, less experienced at the professional level, are starting to understand it, to buy into those roles and what you have to do on this very professional team. So now they're more comfortable getting players like that into the lineup. And I think that's only going to continue to benefit this squad. Yeah, great, great points. Um, you can see the starting to really get more of an understanding together, holding each other accountable too, which is when you know if a coach, you just know you can see yeah. the communication on the pitch. And you mentioned Bahusi. I thought he was very good in midfield as well. Uh, let's go back to York Lions Stadium with reaction from Atletico Ottawa head coach Carlos Gonzalez. I think that we are starting to feel comfortable in, in any phase of, of the game. I, I feel that today we were better in the four phases. We In, in the organized attack uh, during the first half, we had great moments. Uh, of course, when in the in the recovery moment in this counter attack, we we find the spaces that we wanted to to punish them, and also in some moments of the second half, in the first, especially in the first 15 minutes, we were very solid in the organized defense. So I'm feeling that the the team is showing a a very competitive uh, image in every in all the phases of the game. And he's not one for hyperbole, but you can see, Charlie, you were in that no. press conference. We were there. Carlos Gonzalez uh, looked the happiest he's been this season. No, I mean I know I know <laughs> yeah. it was a. You could say if you're a, a neutral, it's a win at York, and the way York are playing, you would expect them to win that. But it is their first ever win against them this season, and you could say that you know th- th- there was a lot that went right within that performance, that regardless of the opponent. You could see why Carlos was really happy yesterday. Yeah, absolutely. He's seeing a lot of the things that they work on so hard in training come to fruition. And, you know, that's something we'll get to is exactly what's not happening for York. But, you know, Ottawa hadn't had maybe a lot of results like this that are kind of big, emphatic wins that you can hang your head on. They'd never won by three goals on the road, certainly. So that's right. a, that's a, another big mark of their progress. And there haven't been these moments where, you know, you you really, like the win games 2-1, 1-0, they'll have these results, but not necessarily a moment where you come out and you, you really dominate a team, especially away from home, is something that is kind of an evolution for this club. And as as Carlos said, he's seeing them improve in, in all of the phases of the game. It's defensively, it's in transitional attacks, it's in slower build-up attacks that they're able to do. So all of these are things that are really coming together, and I, I'm not surprised that he's happy. Yeah, um, overall, terrific team performance. Uh, no question about it. Um, 
I had the chance after the match to pick up some brains, pick the brains of uh, Col- uh, Drew Becky, <laughs> Carlos Gonzalez, lieutenant on the pitch. Um, by the way, the fans were still there at that point before they all rushed to get the coach home. But uh, this was a terrific atmosphere. And uh, here's my chat after the game with the skipper. Christian Jack alongside Atletico Ottawa skipper Drew Becky after a club record 3-0 win here at York Lions Stadium. How does that feel? Uh, it's fantastic. We uh, came with the right mentality just from the beginning. I think at the end maybe we could have kept the ball a little bit better, but you know those are things you improve on, and uh, sometimes when you're up at that, that amount, you, you kind of quit on a few things, but I thought it was a great performance. It was a great performance. You guys are on a terrific run right now, top of the table now this win as well. How important is that for you guys? Yeah, it's a huge win. We've been fantastic away from home. Uh, we just got to continue to keep to growing. You know, we have a good team, uh, a team that can play, in, in, you know, guys that can play in different positions. And I'm, I'm really proud of the guys of how they fought today. And we just got to continue that. Defensively, you're very difficult to break down. We know that one of the best teams in the league. When you go 1-0 up, do you feel that kind of edge already that you know that you can stop these teams? Definitely. We've uh, done a lot of studying of how teams play. Uh, but it, a lot of it comes down to mentality, to, to know that we're going to win the battles 1v1. And, and we're doing that. You know, Miguel's been fantastic. Diego at 19 years old. Uh, whoever's been back there, Max and Niba. Not just the back line. The, the work rate of the midfield is fantastic. Sissoko, McKendry, Aldi. I could name everybody, but it's, yes. uh, it's been great. <laughs> Go through the whole 11, couldn't you? Tactical flexibility is huge for your team as well. We have to talk about this crowd. They're on the way back soon, back to the capital. You gave them your jersey today. How important was it to have these guys behind you oh, it's it's fantastic it, they, when you're out there and you can hear that uh in away game it's it's almost like europe and uh it means a whole lot it means that culture is growing not only in ottawa but in canada and uh, as you've seen firsthand with the national team it's a it's a really special time to be a part of it. i was going to ask you about that this is something that you've been obviously a part of before playing here in canada but does this feel different this canadian premier league now having this kind of fan base yeah, it's, uh, it's growing day by day, as I said, and uh, it's just special. You're part of something, and it's, it's Canada-wide. You see yeah. it at Pacific, you see it here, you see it in Ottawa, you see it in Halifax. That's fantastic, and that's, it's only going to help. We're going to see the benefit in you know five to ten years. Last question for you, Drew. You were just in the dressing room briefly. What's the mood like? I'd imagine it's a, a pretty good one. Yeah, guys are tired, but they're very celebratory, of course. And, and you got to celebrate your victories. you gotta, you got to improve on things, but you got to take it for what they are. And then on Monday or Tuesday, you forget about it and focus on the next one. Club record away win. Three goals in a match for the first time this season. Top of the table for the first time as well. Things are going well. Congratulations, Drew Becky. Appreciate Thanks, this. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Certainly, and you mentioned there, they're away from five wins out of the last six. Uh, that just doesn't happen in the Canadian Premier League. For those new to this league, winning away from home, very difficult. Lots of reasons for that. Um, you know, geographically, the travel, but, uh, you know, Atletico Ottawa at the moment, um, shall we say their away form is massive. Um, what about York United? They're very difficult to uh, break down at the moment in terms of fig- figuring out what they are. They win 1-0 at Cavalry yeah. midweek, and then they come back and expect some momentum, and they, boy, oh boy, they were nowhere near it at the races in this game. Um, let's go back to the stadium before we give our take on it and hear from their head coach, here's Martin Nash. Um, we talked all, all week about our mentality. Um, they need that same mentality, the same energy that we had on Tuesday. Um, plenty of time to recover, and we came out real slow. It was, uh, you know, we were trying to encourage the guys to get on and press. We were real quiet and real slow. Uh, you know, gifted them a penalty, bad touch, and a you know a soft penalty. You know, and then you're under the, then you're now you're under pressure, right? So um, it was it was just slow and sloppy, I thought to start, and then you know, yes, I think the second goal killed us. You know, yeah, it was offside, but you you got to it's still a bad goal to give away. You can't rely on someone else to make make a call. It was. Uh, you know, you can complain that it was offside all day, but if you don't, it was a play that we should have stopped anyways. What a mature press conference. Again, Charlie, you and I were there. Uh, no excuses, holding his team accountable, not blaming officials. Uh, and I think, you know, you're always going to get honesty from Martin Nash, good or bad. Uh, this is a team that started off the season defensively very good uh, and were in almost every game, even though the results weren't going their way. First 11 games in yeah. every game to the whistle, either one goal or less or won the match. Last five games, five of the last six, they've lost by two or more, and they've been outscored 15 to four in those, in, those, in those six games. So defensively now, they've got major problems as well, Charlie, which earlier this season we thought they were, they were fine. So this is the recipe for a very difficult team to watch at the moment for your fans. Yeah, and I, I'm, 
I've used the word frustrating so many times when referring to this team this year, and it's it's getting old. But that really is it. You know, Martin Martin Ash kind of spoke a little bit later in that press conference about some of the specific things that they'd worked on in training. You know, they they didn't want to play ball through the middle against Ottawa, but then you know, two cents plays the ball through the middle, and that's how Ottawa score in transition. Right, they pick off that pass, and it seems increasingly like. They look good in training, and Martin Nash is seeing the progress in training. But then, in in some of these games that they play, especially when they concede early, like they do in this game with that penalty, they start to revert to to habits that maybe they haven't been, or that they've been trying to get out of their game. And they're they're making the wrong passes, or panicking, and just not getting to to the to places where they want to be. York have created the most chances in the league with over over a hundred, which right. is stunning for a team that struggled so much to score goals. Right, so the confidence just isn't there. Um, you're seeing players maybe just forget sometimes about what they want to be doing in their build-up play, how they want to be defending. And I think that's probably the most frustrating thing, is because these are talented players and they work so hard on the training pitch, and you see it come out at times. But you know they'll have these setbacks, they'll have these moments where they play well and they get into the attacking third, and then they concede again, and it's right back to square one. So it, I really I feel for Martin Nash because I, as a coach, you know, there's not not a lot you can do more than give your your team a, a comprehensive game plan and prepare them well for a game. Uh, so to see it not executed is definitely quite frustrating. Yeah, not executed, not doing what they need to do from the training pitch. Classic case of the perfect storm. Suspensions at the wrong time. Jordan Wilson, and Isaiah Johnston missing yeah. yesterday. Key injuries, turnover, player sales. Watch the space for that. New players coming in, by the way. Um, you know, four new players who started the game in this game hadn't even been with the club for a month. Um, you know, and talking of which, I thought one of them, again, was very, very good. Let's go back to the York Lions Stadium and hear from him. Here's Tassimo de Peters. For sure, I think frustrating is a good word for it. Uh, the team, you know, we fought like we have done kind of most of the season. Um, the short time I've been here, we've definitely all, all put in good shifts, work hard, but... Um, at the end of the day, it's that quality in the, in the final third, finishing our chances when we do get them, putting teams to bed um, early, especially. Um, and then being more solid at the back too. I guess the, the penalties and stuff, it's, it's part of the game, but it's frustrating when you can see them because no one means to give away fouls in the box, of course. And um, yeah, at the end of the day, it, the penalties killed us, I think. And, and um, it was an uphill battle from there, yeah. That's the same, the, the, the same kind of discussion over that and over within discipline in the box for them. Um, no doubt about it. Yeah. I think Roger Thompson would have preferred to have a better day. They played a back three to try and protect him a little bit, but not necessarily they need to do. And midfield was a problem for them. And of course, scoring goals. Um, Halifax away next, Valor away, and then Edmonton at home. Uh, they, are three play- they are three teams next for them who are, like York, all out of the playoffs right now. Um, so it is an option, an option for them to try and rescue something and have a little bit of a chance to try and make a bit of a run at the playoffs. But if it goes the wrong way in these three games, after that, Forge, Cavalry, Pacific. So you got to figure it out pretty quickly in the next three games if they're going to have any kind of chance to make it up to the playoffs. But again, another dismal day uh, for York United on Sunday. Uh, Let's bring in our own Benedict Rhodes now. And from York, we head east to the Wanderers grounds where Halifax hosted FC Edmonton. Much to respond to for both. Halifax in losers of four or five heading in. And FC Edmonton's Alan Koch named the same 11 as he rolled out in a 5-1 thrashing at Forge midweek, asking for a response. Benedict, did he get it? Uh, I think to, for some extent he did. I think he wanted a, a stronger performance, and he did get that. Uh, for as you see here, for watching on the video, Tobias Wachowski gave him the lead 19 minutes in, and it held that lead for you know almost an hour. Um, and and the, the issue with them, again, has been you know, closing out games. Uh, Koch rightly said after the game that you know earlier in the season, if they conceded uh, a late equalizer, they most likely would have gone on to lose the game. So I think it's showing signs of improvement that they they didn't, and they, they were able to hold on for for at least a point, uh, especially after the disappointing result midweek. But uh, yeah, again, Alan Koch's side is, is by, by no means perfect, but they're they're definitely showing signs of improvement. They're certainly showing signs of improvement. What about Halifax? Many people, I think the one soccer guys called this a must win if they want to get to the playoffs. It's not quite that, but we know why they call it that. Um, I think their their expected goals was over two for the first time in probably I think all season. We're close to close to over two anyway. They had a lot more of an attack about them, but in the end, still could only get the one goal. Yeah, uh, the, the one goal again came from a penalty as well. So um, that's something that Stephen Hart's team needs to, to do is is take advantage of the opportunities. Uh, he said after the game that uh, you know they're they're very slow this team and and they 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 didn't really play the ball as quick as they would have liked and and allow players like Sam Salter as you see on the screen there to score a penalty. 
uh, to, to you know get those runs in behind and 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 make things happen. But uh, the, the chances are coming, but sometimes, but they they aren't taking advantage of them. And and any team that wants to be in the playoffs has to take advantage of their chances and and beat the teams below them, which is what they failed to do in this game. Before we hear from Stephen, Charlie, your take on Halifax. Stephen said a lot, and he's been saying the same thing. They need to be more braver with the ball, push the attack, play forward, play changes. I mean, we'll get to his changes in a second, but still only seven goals in the last 10 games for this Halifax team. And as Benedict mentioned, quite a few penalties, three there again. Thankfully, they got Sam Salter to put them away. Um, yeah. But the chance conversion from, 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 from creating these chances is very, very low. Yeah, it is. And and I think one of the problems of the way that this Halifax side has attacked in, in, at times this year, it's been, it's been quite, you know, predictable. Stephen Hart talks a lot about how they move the ball too slowly when they, when they win it and they try to get it forward. Uh, so it's, it's sometimes easier for teams to keep them to, to less dangerous areas, keep them to the outside. Um, <laughs> you mentioned Christian, they, they want these attackers to be brave. We do have to talk about Fumpa Mwanwe, who yeah. was uh, just ex- extraordinary when he came into this game. I think I, I don't think I've been as as excited uh, by a Halifax attacking player since Joao Morelli's injury. Uh, the way that he came in and, and kind of seized this game and and was as, as you said brave in what he was doing and, and running at defenders and taking them on and, and beating them for the most part. So that's maybe the biggest positive for Halifax from this for Halifax from this game is that they're able to to change a game and to, to throw something different at an opponent, opponent, which isn't something that they've necessarily been able to do. Again, being predictable with the way that they attack, they haven't been getting runners in behind defense. They haven't been able to play those through balls and that's kind of what they've been missing. So that's the most exciting thing for me. But again, I think it's, it's probably disappointing for Halifax not to, not, not to, to put more pressure on this FC Edmonton side that obviously is quite tired after playing midweek. Yeah, fun for Moanwe, way 21 from Newtown in Wales, where he just came from in the, in the Welsh Premier League. Directness, no, Benedict? What did you like about yeah. his game during the game? Yeah, he's a directness and his, his and tries as well. His, his willingness to just, just run at people and, and, and be fearless. And I think that's something that Stephen Hart's team has, has lacked at times this season with, with No Morelli and, and with some other players maybe out of form. And and uh, he, he one way scored it in the, the way for Conference League like a, a couple of weeks ago. And, and he, he comes in with a the high pedigree for, for such a young player and and uh, I think you no, know, he he did exactly what he was brought on to do in this game, and, and he came on and, and was running at players. He won the penalty, uh, and and he, he probably could have had another goal as well after he dribbled through a couple of defenders. But his uh, his shot was stopped by uh, Andreas Weigler, so he looks looks promising. That's for sure. It certainly is something that Halifax have needed uh, for, for some time, probably pre Morelli injury, even to be quite frank yeah. with Morelli. Um, but thankfully, Absolutely. they found the key to that a little bit of opening up that key to that att- attack right now. Uh, let's go back to Wanderers Grounds. I've been another fantastic crowd there with the reaction afterwards of their head coach, Stephen Hart. Yeah, uh, first half, uh, you know, we, we, we couldn't deal with their, their willingness to run, to press everything, to fight for the first and second ball. We weren't dealing with that well. And I thought we moved the ball way too slow. Way too slow. Uh, second half, we made some changes. And, uh, and I thought young Ryan came on. He, he started to press higher up the park. And uh, when Fumpa came on, we now had a threat behind. And what's a little bit surprising is that uh, Fumpa got fouled five times. He was threatening behind and still at times we were playing the ball too slow. We should have just uh, be, be playing to him until they figure it out. But I guess that's something we will, we will have to learn. But yeah, he changed the game. He, he, he did change the game. Him and Ryan changed the game. Fantastic debut for him. And check him out, by the way. He made the Gatorade Team of the Week, as we announced that later on today. Uh, from one side of the dugout to the other, here's the reaction of FC Edmonton boss, Alan Koch. I think the players executed what we asked them to do. Uh, and it's always challenging to put in a bounce-back performance. We we were very disappointed uh, with our performance and the result in Hamilton on Tuesday. Um, so we wanted to come here and get something. And we all know this is a very, very difficult place to come play. Uh, but I applaud our players' courage and their willingness to do what we asked them to do. Um, a few weeks ago or a month or two ago, this new group, FC Opportunity, would have capitulated. We, we would have conceded another goal and we would have lost. Um, so showing the strength of character to, to hang on and get a point uh, is a nice little reward for the group. They're, they're disappointed we didn't win. I'm disappointed. But at the same time, I'm a little bit satisfied that we actually got something out of the game uh, and it gives us something to build on. At the end. 
So he has something to build on. Um, you have to remember they were thrashed uh, midweek at Forge. So a good reaction. He played the same 11 and they certainly turned that around. One of those players, currently a Forge player on low for FC Edmonton, here's Sean McShaw. A great game. The first 80, 75 minutes and we kind of got stretched both teams because we were both going for the win. Um, but I think, you know, coming off of what happened on Tuesday, the way we uh, came forward today, uh, we put in a good performance. You know, I think we're disappointed we, we couldn't get the win out of that game because a couple of different moments we handled them differently. We walk out with three points instead of one. Um, but for us to build off what happened on Tuesday, especially, and what happened the rest of the season in the past, to you know keep a point, we'll take it. So take the point and get out. That's what Shom's attitude was. Preventing a second three-game winless run this season. They've now not gone three in a row. Would have lost since May. Was that certainly the case, Benedict? A game that Alan Koch not only would have said they would have lost last year, but certainly would have lost earlier this season. Well, they did lose a game like that earlier this season. Last time they're in Halifax, they they scored I think in the ninth minute from from a penalty as well, and and ended up losing that game three one. Uh, so I, I think uh, a point a point is is a is a positive result for them. And and uh, like Shami said uh, after the game as well, like uh, after the result midweek, they needed just uh, some something positive to, to build on. And I think a, a a point on the road and an eleventh game in a row with a goal as well is is definitely something you can build on. And Warshevsky got that goal. What did you like about him? You called him your man of the match for your uh, analysis piece on Campio.ca. Yeah, when he's on the pitch, he's, he's a difference maker, and 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 uh, a lot of the plays go through him. And and that was no different in this game. And uh, you know, when, when he came off the pitch as well, you, you could see he was missed. They they maybe had a bit of a a, a loss of of direction and and an attack and who they wanted to play the ball through. And and that was definitely noticeable when he came off the pitch. So I think uh, Warshevsky is definitely sort of the the quarterback, I guess, if you will, of, of this team. The CPL is better, Charlie, when Toby Wojcicki is playing well, no? Oh, we might have lost Charlie there for a second. Uh, let's go back to reaction at the Wanderers grounds. Uh, a very special day for Matteo Restrepo, who played his final game as a professional player. Um, we're hoping to get Matteo on on the show to tell his story very shortly. Um, but he had the captain's armband, obviously heading off to a prestigious medical school at Mount Sinai in New York um, to do way more, way more important things than playing professional football. Um, here's the reaction after the game from his coach, uh, Stephen Hart. Unbelievable leadership. A complete professional. How he, how he lives off the field, diet, training. I could never ask more of anybody. Um, it's, a, it's a loss for us. Uh, because regardless of if he's starting, not playing, whatever, he is a, a big part of the dressing room, big part of the team. But uh, we want to wish him well because he's moving on to bigger things. Right? And as I said, what he, what he learned in football, what he applies, will serve him well in the future. Great words, Benedict, as we say about it, Charlie. We'll get him back on in a second. Great words from a great man, from Stephen Hart. And talk about great men. Let's get him on himself, Matteo Restrepo. Uh, Matteo, thanks for joining the show. Uh, I know your life is busy and hectic and lots of travel going on right now. Uh, but we really appreciate you spending five minutes or so with us. Um, a monumental, uh, life-changing moment coming for you. But how was Saturday playing that game? And uh, did it help a little bit knowing coming in that you had that time to digest that you knew it was the last one? Um, you know, it was, it was a bit of a weird one. Uh, like I've told my family and friends, it was, it was hard to prepare for it because I knew it was the last one. So I was just trying to take in all of the little things that, that led up to it because I knew it was going to be, you know, the last, the last time I shared a, the locker room with the guys. Um, but at the end of the day, like I've said, like I knew I had a job to do, uh, I wanted to go in there and, and help the boys get the three points. So. I was just trying to kind of put it all away for a little bit while I was playing and, and, and just focus on my game. Yep. Mateo, I, I just, I, I want to maybe talk about how impressive it is, at least to me that, you know, you're, you're able to be a professional footballer while also you know, applying to med schools and, and getting all that done. Can you want to maybe, can you maybe shed some, some light on, on what it was like for you, you know, trying to balance all of these things, you know, education and, and then, I don't know, were you like studying for MCATs while you were going to training and stuff? Like, what was that whole process like to, to get that done and, and still be a professional footballer? Yeah, so, you know, I took advantage of the long off season that we had uh, after the mm -hmm. PEI bubble. When I got home, I just hit the books uh, for four months, four-ish months for, you know, eight hours a day. And then right before starting preseason again, um, before we went to the Winnipeg bubble, I took the MCAT here in Halifax. So, you know, the timing kind of lined up and, and helped me in that way. Uh, I didn't 
I didn't really have to do too much studying while I was also focusing on football because I know that would have been a, a bit difficult. Um, but yeah, I mean, after that, I, I still had to do all my applications and stuff uh, while I was playing football. So there, there was some, you know, some overlap. And Mateo, I know you said that you probably would have been perfect world and nothing's perfect in the world, but for you to finish this season off and then head out there. So what was that like when you obviously got accepted and taking that to the club and how gracious and, 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 and I suppose uh, sporting were they in, in listening to your story and then right, you know, finding that amical agreement for you? Yeah, I, I mean, I knew for a while. Um, I knew for a while that I had been accepted and it was just about you know, finding the right time to tell the club. I was, I was a bit nervous. Uh, I didn't want to disappoint the club. I didn't want to disappoint the boys. I did feel like I was letting them down a little bit, but then, you know, once I told Steven, he was, he just welcomed me with open arms right away. He told me he was proud of me. He told me he understood. Uh, he thanked me for my service to the club. So, you know, just, just the graciousness, the, 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 the acceptance from everybody was was amazing and it just you know highlights that there's amazing people working for the club and there's amazing people in the city yeah it's, it's certainly i i don't think something that the club can begrudge you especially if that's something that you know it's something that you've been working toward for so long but just you know on on maybe the city of halifax and the club mateo you you got there a few years ago after playing in college uh how impressed were you with just how much that club, that city kind of embraces the team, embraced you? And, and what are you going to remember most from this? Yeah, I think, you know, um, coming to Halifax and seeing just how nice everybody is here, how welcoming, you know, since the minute I signed, I got a lot of support from the fans uh, and from everybody in the club. So it, it was a very, very special you know, moment. And it was a very special collection of moments throughout my time here. And that, that's what I'll, I'll most remember, just like the love and support and, and uh, the feeling of family that there is here in, in the city of Halifax and, and within the club. Mateo, you mentioned it a little bit there, but uh, I did ask you this after the game as well. Maybe you want to elaborate on it is uh, what are some, some uh, key memories, I guess, of your time in the Canadian Premier League and you know, the past two and a half years in, in a city like Halifax and with a team like that? Yeah, I mean, there's there's so many to choose from, right? Uh, but as I alluded to, one of the one of the first very special moments was when we found out that we were going to the final uh, in the PEI bubble, and and we were all just you know um, dancing and, and and just having fun with all the boys. Uh, just super proud of, of that accomplishment. Super proud to be to be a part of that in general. Um, and then, you know, after that, it's just, just all the little moments that I'm going to hang on to, you know, the bus rides with the boys, playing cards with them, going out to dinner, um, you know, the small moments of support um, through wins and losses. And, and that, that's what I'll, I'll always hold dearest to, to my heart. That's what's happened. And you'll always carry them. What's forward, you don't know, but you will carry as well. And it's an exciting time. No, I mean, we're getting so many comments here in the chat wishing you well. It's fantastic to see. But what are you excited about the most about the next journey? It takes a special kind of human being to go and, and, and sign up for what you're doing and make a difference in people's lives. Is, is that the connection, Mateo, again, making the connection there that you're going to be connected with people? Tell us your, your hopes and dreams for your next stage of your career. Yeah, yeah. That's, you know, that's something that I'm still trying to figure out myself. There's, um, there's so much that I could do with medicine. There's so many avenues uh, ideally, I do want to com uh, combine both passions for football and, and medicine. So, you know, I'd love to to be a team physician one day, um, you know, help athletes throughout the, the hardest times, like when they get injured. Um, so, you know, I, I'm looking into the orthopedic surgery. I, I'm not sure if, if that's the way it's going to go, um, but it's definitely something that I'm interested in. And I just know that I'm going to be able to, to take all the lessons that I've learned from football, all the little things that it's given me and apply it into this next chapter. So uh, I'm, ex I'm most excited about that. Amazing. Sounds very exciting. Uh, it also sounds exciting to go live in New York and <laughs> go to school there. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I, I'm sure I'm sure you're uh, going to still have an eye on the Wanderers while you're there, you know, be, be cheering them on for, from afar. Oh, 100 percent, 100 percent. You know, I'm going to try to watch uh, every single game that I can. It'll probably be a good study break. Uh, I'll probably be, you know, um, you, just the whirlwind of emotions while, while they're playing, just wishing them well. Um, and, you know, like I'll always feel integrated 
to this group, to the team, to the club. So I'll always, I'll always be here in, in some way, whether I'm, I'm not here emotionally, uh, physically, but always, you know, like in spirit, I guess. And, and Mateo, what kind of lessons can you maybe take from football and from, you know, being a professional athlete and, and how can you maybe apply those to your next career? Yeah, I, I was uh, talking to my coaches about this and just reflecting on everything. And, and, you know, like I've always said, football teaches you most of life's lessons in a span of 90 minutes. Uh, it's you have to deal with the the frustrations, the losses, uh, maybe not, you know, not having a good performance. You have to deal with knowing how to uh, cater your approach to different personalities and knowing how to get the best out of your teammates, whether that's, you know, if somebody needs an arm around the shoulder, if somebody needs you to be a little bit more intense with them. So I think what I'm going to take away from football is just how to, how to, how to deal, how to support people and, and how to, get through the tough moments because I know that there's going to be a lot of tough moments down the road. But uh, once again, I, I know that I've been in a career where I've had to overcome a lot of things uh, and overcome things um, within a group and team setting. Uh, so that's, that's, I think that's like the biggest takeaway that football has, has kind of given me. Um, and, you know, I just, I know that I'll be able to work through whatever, whatever's thrown at me. Yeah. We certainly, you certainly go uh, without blessing and we caught, you know, you know, we can't wait to chat with you again down the line, my friend, because we know this is just the start, right? I guess we'll finish with this. I mean, the Wanderers grounds, we've all been there. It's uh, its probably the best atmosphere in the league. It's certainly the biggest crowd attendance-wise. Is I guess th those memories you'll go with playing under that will carry you for the rest of your life. How exciting was it to play there in that, in that kind of setting? Oh, it, it was amazing. It was amazing. Um, it was fantastic to play there. It was fantastic to um to 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 be in that environment game in and game out and and i mean my last game is just there was so so much support you know like i, I got so many hugs so many good wishes uh so many people wishing me well it was just it was fantastic um and it's something that i'll i'll take away with me for the rest of my life great stuff well thanks so much for everything you've done for the canadian premier league and for the halifax wanderers it's been a pleasure to watch you and uh keep in touch my friend this is just the start we'll have you on again very soon and uh keep let, letting us know what you do you'll be our analyst from afar at the wanderers ground so we'll chat with you again soon i will thank you so much guys appreciate thank it you very much all the best uh in thanks. new york mateo restrepo uh just a class human being no doubt about it gentlemen and uh for sure it's just another unique story right this canadian premier league we sell players off people come in they go different ways benedict but just to watch mateo perform that way in that last game was pretty special yeah his performance as well right like halifax needed someone to, to step up and, and be that leader he mentioned andre rampersad gave him the, the captain's armband and and they needed that leadership and, and he showed it right and uh especially in a, in a game that was so emotional to you know be composed like that and 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 still put in the good performance in front of you know a lot of people in the stands wishing him well it was uh definitely, definitely a, a positive positive game certainly was benedict great work on the online uh, you can read it all on that on campio.ca benedict's analysis including one of the major parts of the story of course was mateo restrepo's final game for the halifax wanderers um we'll move out benedict and we'll bring in mitchell who's been waiting patiently uh and in our second part of the double header on saturday mitch you were there i was there as a vital clash of fourth versus fifth in the table as vala who'd gained 10 points from a possible 12 came to hamilton Forge in need of a real fight, to be honest. They needed a fight here after beating Edmonton 5-1 uh, in their only game in their previous 15 days. And Mitchell, boy, oh boy, they got a test in this one. Yeah, they sure did. And this this felt like a kind of cathartic win for Forge, who evidently last time they played Valor at home were, were shut out in, in back to back shutouts, actually, because Atletico Ottawa would do that as well um in over two games. And I mean, it was a it was a match that really affected them. Um Bobby Smirniotis went on a couple rants about negative football and how he'll never catch Forge playing like that. And it, <laughs> it, it seemed to bother them um, uh, to great extent. And, you know, for large parts of this game, it looked like it was going to be deja vu. Forge got into some great positions um, in that first half. I think they had 18 touches in the Valor box in the first half alone. Um, but Valor, they have like four touches and, and they score on one of them on Moses Dyer header. And, um, evidently, Forge is able to equalize through Wubens Pesius here, a brilliant goal and a, a player that absolutely is is certainly worth highlighting for what he's been doing lately in the Canadian Premier League. But, you know, they go into that second half, they're able to adjust and um, obviously, you know, 
some big moments. Taron Campbell, a player who hadn't scored in three months, comes off the bench and, and gives Forge two goals here to to get, like you said, a, a huge result for them in a fourth versus fifth matchup. Yeah, Mitchell, you mentioned they had to adjust, and that's kind of the, the right the right way to put it because obviously you know, we always knew that Valor could hit them hit them you know on a, on a counterattack they make a mistake which is fairly uncharacteristic but they do make that mistake earlier on and you know they pay for it but uh it seemed maybe at that point a little bit like it's like okay here we go again you know Forger going to have so much of the ball and they're going to be laboring it forward under just that incredible heat at Tim Hortons field that there was that day um but eventually they make these adjustments obviously Campbell comes in uh Wubens with just all the confidence in the world right now uh to take on that that ball and, and try to finish it like that I don't think there's a lot of players in the CPL that would even attempt that at the moment <laughs> and then Campbell comes in and that's exactly what he needed uh that that first goal he scored especially I think is a goal that maybe earlier in the season he might take an extra touch on when mm. you really don't need to so for him to just smash that in the net uh is is fantastic and if he is starting to pick up that confidence in that form alongside what Wubens Pasias is doing at the moment, then uh, Forge are terrifying to play against at the moment. Yeah, that's a good point because I think that's something that we've seen from Pasias recently and his, his, you know, moments of confidence and the number of goals is he gets an opening and, you know, there's no second guessing. He's taking that shot. He's finding that lane. And uh, that's something that we've seen certainly from him lately and something that we saw from Campbell as well. But, yeah, this was a this did need some adjusting from Forge because especially to start the second half, you know, with the game at one one, Valor come out and they were pressing Forge very very hard. They were causing Forge. Yeah. You, you mentioned the word uncharacteristic, some uncharacteristic mistakes and turnovers at the back, um, and there were moments where it really looked like Forge were in trouble. And you know, they bring on Ashton Morgan. They have more experience at the back, um, and he's able to to help them through that and then it's it's a forge press and that's something that they've talked about a lot recently especially playing against teams in low blocks is they have to find different ways to to unsettle them and their counter press has been a big one recently where you know they've even talked about maybe even losing the ball in strategic positions sometimes so they can go and win it back and that's just another you know aspect that they have to to their lineup and we see that with the second goal you know becker pressing uh run down at the top of the box and wins it back and uh, there's your there's your go-ahead goal. That was the decisive moment, no question about it. Rendong didn't turn and Becker was on him right away. Uh, and Becker ended up being the calmness to put him in the position for Terran Campbell to make, they get the goal. Uh, talking of which, here's my chat after the game on the pitch at Tim Hortons Field with the captain, Cal Becker. Christian Jack alongside Cal Becker, the captain of Forge, after a terrific 3-1 win. You had to work hard for that one. What were your thoughts after this? Yeah, it was tough. Obviously, we knew coming into it, uh, we are going to have to battle the heat. Um, it was a tough one, but... You know, we just had to, to kind of stick to the game plan. We had a little bit of a, we had a good start and then we kind of dropped. They did well. They killed us on that counter a little bit and kind of took the sting out of the game for a few minutes. But we got into halftime, we regrouped, and uh, I think the response was excellent. It was a good response. You talk about the heat, probably one of the hottest games we've had ever in the Canadian Premier League. But the presses on both teams seem to be really out there. And in the end, your press and you able to get the ball there was the key for the second goal. What did you see? Yeah, we knew if we could kind of put the other team under, it was, uh, it was going to be difficult for them to get out. Obviously, when you're battling these elements, it is it is difficult and it kind of gets on top of you and, it's, and it is hard to play. So we knew if we kind of got on top of them and, and pressed them high up the pitch, we could have some success and, and, and it worked out for a goal, which is good. I think it's your first win at home after going behind for 11 months. You won that game 3-1 as well against York. It's been a couple of games this year where you've gone behind and haven't been able to score goals like that. How big is it to win a game like this as a, as a reference point going forward where you dug deep and came out on the right end of it? It's huge. It's huge for the group. I think it's good for our mentality to know that we can kind of stick together and kind of keep getting after it. Obviously, when you go down in a game, when you go down at home, it, it, it's tough. It can kind of weigh on you mentally, especially with the pressure we were putting under them for the first 20, 25 minutes. So I think the response from the guys was excellent. It's uh, something I think we need to take in stride and, and keep going with. Last couple, but let's talk about a couple of strikers. Let's do Rubens first. Rubens Basias, a hat-trick midweek against Edmonton, and then a massive goal, big rep before half-time. How key was that? And what of a difference maker he's becoming for you? It's huge. I mean, he's showing that he only needs half a yard, and he's going to take his chances. And, and to be a striker, to put the ball in the net, it's, it's huge. That's what you want to do. That's what you get paid to do. And it's easier said than done. So it's fantastic that he's in that form. It's fantastic for T to come in, get those two goals, even for Emma to get that assist. It's, it's huge for our front three to be contributing like this. Yeah, I was going to ask you about Taryn Campbell. First goals for three months, but massive for him. And I'm sure you were delighted when he got both as well at the end. Absolutely. We needed that. 
I think it's it's fantastic for his confidence. It puts a lot of pressure on Bobby to to pick that front three week in and week out. But that's what we need to do. That's our responsibility as players, and it's it's great that these guys are stepping up. Three goals, another three points for Forge. Thanks, Kyle Becker. Great to see you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks to Cal and thanks to the DJ who played the Alex Ashnoli Janssen <laughs> ABBA remix in the background uh, to celebrate the Swedish midfielders uh, slash defenders outstanding play again. Um, with more reaction and no more ABBA remix, let's go back and listen to Bobby Smith. Maybe not a tale of two different halves. I think in the first half, we were very good in the first 20, 24 minutes of the game. Um, then their goal comes and uh, I think, you know, it comes out of, you know, uh, against the play. Um, a little bit, and I think that uh, that knocked us off of our feet for about 10 minutes. And something we talk about, you know, if, if we want to do some of the stuff that we want to do on the pitch, we can't be phased when we get, uh, you know, hit maybe and go down early in the game. Um, so I thought we were very good for the first 20 or 25 minutes uh, of the first half. And then, yeah, the second half, I thought uh, we were much better in the whole of, of how things looked. And uh, we've done a good job today. You know, you've come back from, from being down in a game. Um, you obviously got a bitter taste from a few weeks ago when you uh, lost the game as a team um, to Valor. Uh, so when you go down, you know it's a it's a big thing on the character of the players uh, to come back, put the performance in that they need, and what was tough conditions for for both teams uh, a little bit with uh, with the heat and uh, humidity out there. Quickly before we move to Valor on Bobby Sminiotis, Mitch, you were in the press conference. I thought he went out of his way and was really really good with his backing of Terran Campbell. I mean, we mentioned it. Campbell hadn't played; a, he hadn't scored a goal in any other game apart from one game in against Edmonton. No goal in the league for three months, over 500 minutes. Gets two in, obviously the same half. Uh, but Bobby Smiliotis didn't act that way at all. He had nothing but incredible backing and talking about a bright future for him at the club. Yeah, absolutely. And this is this is a theme from him. This is something that he mentioned in the match before against FC Edmonton, where Taron Campbell comes on in the second half and you know doesn't score or get an assist or anything like that. You that you'd see on the score sheet, but plays his role perfectly well. Um, you know, he's a player that has that flexibility, and in that match, he was playing on the on the right flank and. Um, Smirniotis went out of his way, not even asked about that to mention Taron Campbell in, in that uh, and, you know, those little performances. And that's what you obviously need to do when you have a big side like Forge with multiple players. And when you're going to need all of those players over the course of a season, you need to make sure everyone's confidence is up. Um, he mentioned how well Campbell's been training, that he's basically automatic in training at this point when he gets chances. So, you know, again, Campbell has been a, if Forge had been a sleeping giant through at least the start of the season, Campbell has been a sleeping giant in uh, so many aspects. And if he can get back to the form that he was in certainly last year, you know, Forge just take that next step in terms of becoming more and more dangerous. Yeah, certainly do. Another aspect to their scoring threat already. Uh, and a threat they didn't have a lot last year. They've definitely moved into another gear this year. Uh, from the Valor side, we head back to Tim Horton's field, the reaction of their boss, Philip DeSantos. A yeah, difficult do, tweak because yeah. things were thrown at us in a way where we 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 had to deal with it, and I uh, it's disappointing that we we weren't able to to finish off. And I think that you know when when there is fatigue and accumulated fatigue, it could blur certain decisions. And um, you know I just feel that overall you come here, you play a game where yeah Hamilton had had the ball in in a lot of, of, of spells and. But I don't think they were creating very clear chances. And it's disappointing when you give away the second goal the way you did in a game where we knew it was hard for us to overplay in our half and we didn't want to overplay in our half. And I think we did a little bit too much at times. Um, and once you give that second goal, it, it becomes hard because you're chasing against a very good team that has quality and pieces to hurt you if you're not careful in the way you're going to deal with the ball. Five weeks ago, they got thrashed at home 4-2 by Cavalry. Since then, four games out of five away from home, and they get 10 points from 15. So they're still in the race. Um, obviously, a difficult loss, but still in this ballot and difficult to break down. So we'll keep an eye on them. Mitchell, stick around as you were the correspondent also for some Friday night football on the island. And Pacific versus Cavalry is already one of the best rivalries in the league, and it lived up to the hype again with this one bringing a lot of intensity and a home attack that continued where it left off, having already netted 10 goals in three games heading into this one, and they didn't take long to continue to bag in the goals. No, they certainly didn't, and that's been uh, obviously a theme for them recently in their kind of return to, to form um, is this ability to score and uh, another three-goal game in this one. But obviously, 
what's been lacking for them is keeping balls out of their own net with that first three goal performance they allow cavalry to score three um they had you know the ship two against york same with fc edmonton and, and some of those performances as well you know i thought york outplayed them at large for large stretches during that uh that match you know edmonton nearly come back all the way after um pacific had gone up three nil in that match this was a much more complete performance um not only are they able to to get the three goals but they're also so solid defensively um a, a great performance from you know callum irving as well who um when he's at his best is is one of the best shot stoppers certainly in this league and i think that this is you know the, uh big indication that pacific is back was was certainly this match especially against the opponent that they did that and they were thrilled to be top of the table even if it was just for like you mentioned i think 48 hours they were very very happy with with you know the fact that they were able to return to that summit and that was a big deal for them Speaking of being back, Manny Aparicio is back, baby, and for real this time. Uh, Mitchell, you, you you mentioned it in your, your match analysis, how good that pairing of Aparicio and Sean Young was in this game. Just what did you see from, from them, and how big a boost is it for Pacific to have this guy back and, and, and you know, firing on all cylinders again? Yeah, David Norman Jr. cleaned out, uh, I think it was Bustos, maybe 15 minutes into the match. It was like deja my, vu. Yeah, my yeah. first th my first thought was, get Manny away. <laughs> Don't let Manny <laughs> go in there. Um, thankfully, he didn't. And yeah, he was able to have a fantastic performance. And that's an exciting midfield pairing for them. Obviously, they have some depth there now with Manny coming back. Jamar Dixon's another um, excellent midfielder. But in terms of a midfield two, first off, both of them are excellent in terms of their energy they they can get everywhere on the field they can cover well for each other if one decides to go forward the other can stick back and and hold um they're you know great in distribution there was a there was a play uh, i think early in the the first half where young plays through daniels and you know he nearly scores and it's just a brilliant ball through the heart of cavalry and that was something they did very well too they were incredibly direct in this match and i don't think cavalry expected that at all um, which which was a big uh, game changer for them. So I, I think that, you know, having these two players and having Young to be able to learn from an experienced guy like Aparicio in this league is is going to pay massive dividends. Yeah, Sean Young, a very important part of that team. No doubt about it, you know, because Ajabrahu left and they need him to continue to play more minutes than he did last season. And I know they're big believers of him there. They're also big believers of Marco Bustos, who had a fantastic start to the season. In fact, becoming April Player of the Month at the Canadian Premier League after his terrific assists in the first month, but has had a bit of a dip in form and also was out of the lineup for a couple of games as well. But Bustos talking about being back seemingly is back. And here's his thoughts after this one. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's difficult to explain, you know, uh, as a as a soccer player, as an athlete, you know, you the best players, you know, at the at the highest peak, you know, go through this, and you know, I, I was fighting it a bit for sure, you know, frustrating times and and all that, and you know, thinking too much at times, but uh, today, you know, the last the last two weeks, I've been really free and. And enjoying it, and you know, I, I really felt like today there was uh, one was going to drop, and obviously it did. And I'm super thankful for my teammates, you know, my coaches, and everyone around me, you know, being positive and pushing me to for that goal. You know, and it meant a lot to me today, and uh, you know, I'll enjoy it today. Obviously, enjoy the three points, which is the most important. And uh, you know, nice to get that little bit of uh, I wouldn't say pressure, but a little bit of that doubt off my back and. And we keep going and look forward to Jamaica. I was going to say, they are now in Jamaica ahead of that game on Tuesday. We'll get into that shortly, but more of this game quickly. And we go back for reaction on Cavalry and their head coach, Tommy Wilden Jr. Just because of probably the result. I mean, we didn't give ourselves a chance with the goals we conceded. And usually we've had the ability to adapt. Um, they played very direct and usually Pacific are a team that like to move the ball around and they didn't. They just launched it long, played second ball, played down our throat and we didn't cope with it. And uh, usually our players can adapt to that, secure the ball, deal with that. And that's what probably Charlie's saying is embarrassed about the scoreline because it's our worst loss in our young club history. So uh, it doesn't feel pretty good. Not a version of themselves. That's what he's referring to. When he talk about Charlie, he's talking about Charlie Trafford's clips. We'll play that next. Here's the midfielder. We leave here embarrassed. To be fair, it's that's not us, you know. That's not the Cavalry boys. So, just disappointed in in everything. We got outworked, outran. They they played a very direct game today, and and we were yeah we were slow. We were sloppy. We 
we looked kind of in our shell. I don't know what it was. Um, yeah, it's definitely not like us. So they just they looked like a stronger team today. So sometimes you have to hold your hand up, but we'll go back to the drawing board right away and and go work on it. But yeah, if we leave here embarrassed, to be fair. Interesting words. Mitchell, a week ago, we we're talking about Cavalry on a club record 11 game unbeaten run. Um, and now they've lost two in a week. Anything that you saw there that was a little bit more long-term concerning or was it just simply, as they kind of alluded to, a bad night of the office? I think more a bad night of the office. Again, one of the interesting things is we've talked at length on this show. I think AGR had a super good analysis of of how that they form their game plan to the opposition and how they're they're kind of set up for that. And they just weren't expecting Pacific to play like they were. Tommy mentioned it there. You know, they're expecting them to be a little less direct, to shift the ball side to side and, and play the the more Pacific way that we've expected. And the fact that they just went direct, I think, caught Calvary completely off guard. So um, I don't think there's too much to, to be worried about with this Calvary side. They have plenty of depth and, and you know, plenty of time to to fix things now it's been a, a crazy hectic stretch for them as well in terms of matches so um you know i think that this is one of those learning moments for them but i can't imagine that they won't be near the top of the table come uh, the end of the season talking of the table let's put that up one thing i would say is that one thing for cavalry now is that they've got they have to wait two and a half months until they get another piece of Pacific. Mm. Not play them until the very last game of the season. Who knows by then what those games will look like and we'll be playing on those matches. Um, but they have to wait two and a half months to get at that rivalry. And uh, well, I think we'd all sign up neutrals to have those teams play each other in the playoffs as well, <laughs> just because it's a pretty <laughs> spicy one. Uh, but there are, the play- there are the standings and Atletico Ottawa are top. That's right. Worst to first is complete as they are top of the league right now for the first time Pacific, Cavalry and Forge all seemingly starting to have a bit of a gap on the bottom four, Charlie, although Valor will certainly think that they've still got a lot to play for in the second half of the season. Yeah, they have a lot to play for, but it is getting getting to that point where the results have to start coming in, otherwise this four-pack is going to to really drift away from the bottom four. I, I think the, the coolest thing about this is that those top four are all within shouting distance of each other. You, know, you see it when you have... Within a, within a few days, you have three different teams at the top of the table. But, I mean, even aside from those three teams, would anybody su- be surprised if Forge ended the year at the top of the table? So uh, I, I'm very excited to see how this continues to unravel. It's awesome having a proper proper battle for position at the top of the table. And, you know, those those bottom four definitely are uh, starting, to, starting to feel the heat a little bit. You have to pick up some results soon if you want to be part of that discussion in a month or two. Certainly do. Uh, we have some midweek action in the CPL. We'll get to that in a little bit and look ahead to next weekend's fixtures. But before we do that, the double header is complete on Can- the Canadian double header on Tuesday. You many people will be aware that the Can Champ final in the White Cats versus TFC happens West Coast time, 7 30, 10 and 30 Eastern. But before that, it's a big double header for the Canadian League because in the Canadian Premier League, we have Pacific right now playing Waterhouse in Jamaica in the CONCACAF League, treading where only Forge have ever been before. That's right, the champions go into CONCACAF play for the very first time. Recently, we had a chance to sit down with some of their players and hear their thoughts in playing in CONCACAF League action. Yeah, I mean, this is what it's about. This is why we play the game, is to play big games. So it's exciting. And we're going to go play it in Jamaica. So it's huge for the club. It's huge for us. And I can't wait. It's amazing. It's another stepping stone, right? Uh, that's why we play the game. It's a different world. It, it truly is. And I've explained that to some of these guys. Um, it's not going to be easy to walk in there and just, you know, get a W. You know, we got to be clever. we got to be smart. we gotta, we got to really take a step up and be professional, right? Get in, get in, get in, get in. I've had the privilege to play in CONCACAF and, you know, going to Honduras, um, these kind of places, Mexico, you know, playing against Tigris, you know, this is, this is big, you know, it's, uh, it's a step in the right direction for CPL, uh, you know, Forge has done it already and now, now Pacific as an organization is going to be in it and, you know, going to Jamaica, you know, it's going to be different for everyone. I think that's everyone's goal, you know, make it far in that competition so we can, you know, not just show CPL, but, but the world and all the eyes watching, or, you know, what we're made of. It's an exciting moment for the club. Uh, I think this is something that uh, Pacific want to con- continuously do year in, year out. So that's what we're striving for. It's not just to, to get into playoffs. It's just a matter of knowing what we want to do um, for this year and the following years to come. I mean, I'm a BC kid. 
and uh, the island's special to me now for the last three years I've spent here. And to be able to represent this place within the region um, means a lot. I mean, you see the fans out here every weekend supporting us, and so uh, it's going to be great. And for me, it's just you go out and enjoy the moment, uh, the experience, and you test yourself against somebody new. You know, we're going to go there, uh, they're going to come here, we don't know them, they don't know us, you know, and you just go from there. It's a game of football, but it'll be, it'll be fun, you know, and exciting. Mitchell, Charlie, I'm pumped for this game. I, I yeah. love CONCACAF play. I love to we'll see one of our new clubs go there for the first time. We've seen it with Forge for a couple of years and how proud they made everyone in the Canadian Premier League. On charter territory, they were magnificent. These countries had never heard of the Canadian Premier League. They're giving Forge a round of applause in different countries, hostile countries as well. And now the champs, Charlie, Pacific, get their chance to go do that. And that's one of the great presents that come with winning the trophy, that you get to go out there and test yourself, as Marco Busso said, in a different region. And that's just fantastic for the sport in this country. Yeah, it really is. I'm so excited for, for this game as well. And I'm excited to see a new CPL team try this journey because we saw Forge do it three times. They were so impressive. But now we find out if it was just Forge that are able to do that or if it's a mark of the Canadian Premier League's level that, that all of our, our champions can do it. Uh, so I'm excited. It's going to be a, a fun game down in Jamaica. Obviously a very difficult one. Um, you know, it's, it's July in Jamaica, so it's going to be very hot and humid. Uh, it, the weather's calling for for some thunderstorms but hopefully those hold off we've had <laughs> we've had moments with that in the CONCACAF league before but fingers crossed but yeah Waterhouse is a very good team they've been top of the table in Jamaica for three years now um in a in a row so it's gonna be hard it's gonna be hard but for Forge you really just need a decent result on the road and then you show them how it's done back home at Starlight Stadium the week after Mitchell, it sounds like Charlie's doing a deep dive on the Jamaican weather and the Jamaican Premier League all morning. I don't know what you think about this. Uh, so it's the games at Sabina Park, by the way. And, and anyway, I know you guys are not cricket buffs, but I am. Some unbelievable cricket games have been played at Sabina Park with the, the, the legends of the game, Curtly Ambrose, Brian Laura, and everyone else. So hopefully, uh, in, in that kind of spirit, Pacific can put on a, legend, a, a legendary performance. But Mitchell, I feel like you've been watching CONCACAF. I uh, games pretty much all your life. Anyone who hasn't, mm -hmm. can you give them a little bit of an idea what kind of calf games can be like for these Canadian teams? <laughs> Oh man, that sounds sad that I've been watching CONCACAF games all my life. <laughs> <laughs> but they uh, are different, no? Yes, different. yeah, they are different. There is certainly, um, yeah, there's certainly some some aspects to it. And I, I actually was talking with Marco Bustos um, and and Manny Aparicio about some of this this past week. And yeah, everything's different from you know going to the stadium. You're in that that bus. You've got a police escort. There's fans heckling you from the second you step onto that bus to you know, the second you step back onto that bus to leave the stadium. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's there's certainly aspects there throughout the match. You know, they, they talked about the surface. Maybe it won't be cut quite as nicely as you would expect just so that they can provide a home advantage. Any and every advantage that, you know, the, the home team can get in CONCACAF, they will go and try to do. So that is what, uh, you know, certainly Pacific will face when they head to Waterhouse. Yeah, campl.ca, Mitchell's piece on uh, CONCACAF expertise with uh, the likes of Aparicio and Bustos is a must read. Charlie's all over the preview, will be all over the game as well for that. Um, uh, final thought on this, as usual, should always go to the coach. Uh, here's James Merriman on the special occasion of representing the city and the league. Hey, you guys earned the right to be in this competition by beating Forge in the final, by right? winning the CPL championship. Um, they're obviously a club that's been in this competition three times now. They've yeah. done some impressive things, kind of you know, flying the Canadian flag across the continent, so to speak. Yeah. How much of an honor is it for you guys to kind of take up that mantle to to go and represent Canada on the international stage? Yeah, we we need to understand that as a as a club and as a team, and and we do as an organization. And our players need to know that we're representing more than you know just ourselves. We're representing. Uh, the Canadian Premier League as well when we go into this and full credit to Forge for what they've done in the competition they did very very well um, and you see the confidence that and the experience that they came out of that competition and out of those games with so we want that as well we want that experience we want that growth uh, you know taking on those challenges going into different environments and they've brought it back to the Canadian Premier League we, will, we want the same um, for us as a team and also for you know our individual players as well to grow and develop and and push on so there's a lot to to gain out of the competition for for ourselves 
A reminder, 8 o'clock Eastern kickoff live on One Soccer on Tuesday night. Um, the precursor to the CanChamp final. So check it out. Get behind Pacific, support Canadian soccer as they go to Jamaica representing Canada and in the CONCACAF League. All right, before we wrap up, time now to break down the games coming up next week in the CPL. This, of course, brought to you by CPL Predictor and brought to you, of course, by Come On. Your chance to test yourself against CPL fans to win cash and other lucrative prizes. Just predict the scores and go to campl.ca forward slash predictor. Uh, we have a Wednesday game. You can also predict that, but that's an isolated game this week. Cavalry playing this week against Forge on Wednesday. That's a massive game as well. Uh, but this is your weekend fixture list next week, and it is a long weekend it starts on Saturday. Uh, let's get the boys to pick out some scores against Predictor Expertise. Mitchell, Valor against Pacific. Pacific Oof. coming back from Jamaica, heading home. Uh, what do you expect from this one? Ooh, that, that is a difficult one. That was one of the ones I was hoping you wouldn't put me on the spot for, <laughs> to be glad honest. I did but, it then. Yeah, yeah. Um, I... I'll give the edge to Valor. You know, they haven't been at home much lately. Um, that is going to be a very difficult trip for Pacific. And obviously, they'll have their eyes on on the, uh, the you know, CONCACAF League home match as well. So, um, I'll, I'll give the edge to Valor. I'll say maybe, I mean, it's a Pacific game. So, maybe 3-2 for, for Valor. It'll be a wild one. There you go. It sounds like you're giving the old Europa League flu to Pacific there. You know, when you play <laughs> on Thursday and then you come back for a Sunday game, you don't play very well in England. Um yeah. Cavalry, uh, FC Edmonton, I think most people will put Cavalry down to win. I just say this, Edmonton play Cavalry really close lately. Uh, so if you want to be a little bit different, maybe pick something there. Um, Ottawa are high flying, but they are going to get tested in this one, Charlie, against Forge on Sunday. Uh, this is going to be a great game. What do you think? Oh, this is this is actually the one that I didn't want to pick. Um, <laughs> yeah. This is a tough one. I'm going to say, you know, last, last time these teams played at, at Tim Hortons Field, it was a tough one for Forge. I think that there's a, a little a little hunger for revenge. I'm gonna go with two all in this there game. You go. Two two. Like it. And I will uh I'll I'll stick right in the middle as well and go for a classic three three Halifax York because you know what? We've had it before. And that was an absolute <laughs> screamer of a game that day when we had Halifax York 3-3 on a holiday. So if we can have that again, that would be fantastic next week because that was a magnificent game last week. Yeah. Um, this has been a great show. Uh, my thanks to Benny, Mitchell, Charlie, as usual, and of course to Matteo Restrepo. Thanks to all the coaches and of course one soccer for the footage. We'll be back next week on Tuesday. That's right. We'll let the Monday marinate and what a fantastic holiday traditional game that will always be at the Wanderers grounds as well. Gentlemen, thanks again. Appreciate your hard work. Campio.ca to read their stuff. And we'll see everyone next week. Enjoy the games. Take care of yourselves. God bless. And we'll see you soon. Outside of the boot from Bustos. Down for Daniels. Roll off ball. They're going to try to put on. It's in the back of the net. A mistake from the Cavalry keeper. And that might be Marco Bustos' first of the year. Messias tracks that down, what a goal!